When I was about 15, I had a week of work experience. Americans would call that an internship, but that's not really right. Work experience is a, a thing in British schools that basically just gets the older kids out of the way for a few days and palms them off on local businesses so the teachers can have a break. I can't actually remember the name of the company now, but anyway, they had a problem. They had recently scanned in a load of photos, all the history of the place, but those photos weren't categorized. They just had hundreds, maybe a couple of thousands of pictures, all in one folder with arbitrary file names. And the work experience kid got assigned the job of going through them all and writing descriptions. Well, that's boring, I thought, because of course I did. It was really dull. It's the job you give the work experience kid because they're not disenchanted enough with the world yet. So in between typing the descriptions, I figured I would show off and I would write a system to search through them. It'd be like Yahoo or that new Google thing that was starting to become popular. It'd, it'd look great. I'd look really smart. Uh, I didn't know anything about how to build that, but with utterly unjustified confidence, I figured it couldn't be that big a problem. And it, it wasn't. Take a search word, loop through all the descriptions, count how many words match, and then return all the matching results sorted by the number of matches. And yeah, worked fine. Until I got over about 50 photographs, at which point it started to get a little bit slow. And after 100, it started to get really slow, and I started to spend more time trying to fix it and less time actually doing my job. Actually, I mean, I wasn't getting paid, so... Anyway, to explain why my code sucked, let's talk about big O notation. Whatever you're coding, there are almost certainly many different ways to approach the problem. But even though all those approaches can end up with the same result, they may take vastly different amounts of time or memory to get there. And the best example of that is sorting. An animation like this is a classic of computer science. I remember seeing demonstrations of things like this on a DOS computer, complete with bleep bloop sound effects when I was tiny. So we've got a bunch of different sized blocks. We've got a list. What algorithms can we use to put our list in order? Let's start with something called bubble sort. Take the first two blocks and compare them. If the first one is longer than the second, swap them. If not, leave them where they are. Now compare the next two blocks, same again. If they are in the wrong order, swap them. If they're not, leave them. And so on, and so on, and so on, until we get all the way to the end of the list. And at that point, we have moved the biggest block in the list to the very end, and that's all. And no, it's not very efficient, but it has now been done. So now we can go again from the start. We can compare, swap if we need to, compare, swap if we need to, compare, swap if we need to, and so on, and so on, and so on. And if we get all the way start to finish without moving a thing, then we know that everything is sorted and we can stop. And if not, we go back to the start. And eventually, after many, many, many passes, congratulations, we have a sorted list. Bubble sort, with each block bubbling up, is terrible. It has to check every block in the list on every pass, and in most cases, it will have to pass through the list as many times as there are blocks on it. 10 blocks means 10 operations performed 10 times. 100 blocks means 100 operations performed 100 times. The number of operations it has to perform goes up with the square of the number of blocks, which means that it has a big O of n squared. The foundations of big O notation, plus that O symbol, were laid down towards the end of the 19th century by German mathematicians working in analytic number theory. But it was popularized in computer science by the great Donald Knuth in the 1970s. K Knuth? I should have checked that. Anyway, big O distills an algorithm down to a single expression, which indicates how it performs as you add more blocks, more inputs of any kind. It lets you compare roughly, approximately, in a, in a big picture sense, how slow an algorithm will get as you add more and more complexity. N squared means that the processing time goes up with the square of the number of inputs. Double the number of inputs and the runtime quadruples. The lowest big O notation that an algorithm can reasonably have is constant, O1. That means that no matter how much stuff you throw at it, it's going to return its answer in the same amount of time. And O1 is usually something really simple, like return the first item in the list. Some common algorithms have a big O of n, or linear. This means that processing time goes up at a steady rate with the number of items. So if your code needs to go to a list and just do one thing to each item in it, that would be linear. Double the items, double the processing time. So let's try some other sorting algorithms. Here is insertion sort. Start with the second item, compare it to the item before. If they're the wrong way round, swap them. Now take the third item and compare it to the one before. If they're the wrong way round, swap them. And then check again with the one before that. 
Basically, you keep moving each item in turn towards the start, checking as you go until either you find something smaller and you know it's in the right place, or you reach the start of the list and you know it's the smallest. If you've got a hand of cards and you are putting them in numerical order, this is the algorithm you're probably using without even thinking about it. And yes, that is usually faster than bubble sort, but crucially, its big O notation is also n squared. And this is a really important distinction to make. If two algorithms have the same big O, it doesn't mean they perform the same. It just means that if you draw the graphs of how they get worse with more inputs, those graphs have the same shape. For both bubble sort and insertion sort, if you double the number of items, it will quadruple the runtime. But with insertion sort, that runtime is usually shorter to begin with. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of every sorting algorithm. There are a lot of them, but there are two I want to flag up. The first is quick sort. Choose an item on the list and call it the pivot. Then go through the list, putting anything smaller than the pivot somewhere to its left and anything larger somewhere to its right. Once that's done, you look at just the ones to the left of the pivot and you do the same. You choose a new pivot and you split those and you repeat that divide and conquer all the way down. And then you do the same to the other side of each of those pivot points and work your way back up. And the worst case big O notation for this is still n squared. But the average performance on a random list is n log n. I'm not going into the mathematics, but suffice it to say that is a lot, lot better. And then on the other end of the scale, there is Bogosort, which is designed as a joke. Bogosort is really simple. Randomize the list. Is it sorted? Great. If it's not, randomize again and keep going until it's sorted. The average performance there is O n plus 1 factorial. You can draw a graph of all the common big O notations to compare them, but the important thing is the big O of whatever you're coding is going to be mostly affected by the worst one of those that you have anywhere in it. If your code does 10 operations that are linear and one that's got a big O of n squared, well, your program is n squared now. Remember, it's just an approximation. It's a guide for humans to work out which algorithm is best to use. Despite being about computer science, it's a little bit fuzzy. So what should I have done with my search system back when I was a kid? Well, I could have used code that was already out there, realized that other people had done the work for me. And that's true. But ultimately, what I should have done is what the client asked for. Typed the descriptions into a word processor and saved it as a document because that was a better solution. They could have just searched it by pressing Control F. Text doesn't break down or need updating when an operating system gets upgraded. If they had new photos to add, anyone who knew how to type could update it. They could still open that document today. The big problem wasn't that I used a bad algorithm. The big problem was that I was ignoring what my users actually needed because I wanted to show off how clever I thought I was. It's important to think about how fast things will work, sure, but the best solution isn't always the fastest or the smartest. It's the one that works for everyone, long term. This series of The Basics is sponsored by Dashlane, the password manager. And there's one aspect of password managers that I haven't talked about in these sponsored sections yet, protecting you against phishing attacks. This is a slightly embarrassing story, but let's say you've signed up to Dashlane, which incidentally you can do by going to dashlane.com slash tomscott for a free 30-day trial of Dashlane Premium. And let's say that at some point later on you are exhausted and tired and you click a link to view a Google Doc that someone has shared with you and you get asked to sign into Google and you just assume that your session is timed out for security as it does sometimes. So you type in your email address. I'm saying you here, but this literally happened to me because I was exhausted and not thinking straight. So let's say I did that. And then my password didn't autofill because the domain name wasn't right. It wasn't a Google page. And Autofill checks the domain that you're logging into. If the domain doesn't match, it won't type your password in for you. And that was the clue I needed to wake up and realize that actually that wasn't a real login link. And that was a really close call. The people trying to pull off a phishing attack only have to fool you once. Now, password managers aren't foolproof. There is always someone more foolish. I could have assumed something was broken in the software and tried to copy and paste my password instead. But it was enough of a red flag, enough of a warning that I saw what was happening. So dashlane.com slash Tom Scott for a 30 day free trial of Dashlane Premium, which includes unlimited password storage and sync, plus a load of other features. And if you like it, you can use the code Tom Scott for 10% off.